Welcome to Garden Fork Radio. You're here with Rick and Eric. Good morning, Eric. How are you, my friend? I'm good. How are you, sir? Never better. It's a beautiful uh, Saturday morning. We had uh, some terrific rain uh, Friday and a little front that passed through, and it is dry and cooler. And uh, here in Margaritaville Nord, uh, that's that's really important. Yay. Yay. Today we're going to talk about... uh, If you at least try, you can't fail. I have a couple lessons in that, life lessons from today. Uh, We're going to talk about skylight installation. Very exciting. Yeah. And we have some viewer mail from one of our Patreon contributors, Scott, who's going to be a guest on the show. Thank you, Scott. And an interesting website called GoFundMe. So stick around for the show here. Um, If this is your first time, welcome. And uh, happy to have you here. How was that? That was good. Yeah, I sound like a podcaster, don't I? You do. You sound like you got something to sell. We've been doing this for almost 300 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm finally getting it. So everyone, I um, I actually have self-doubt a lot. This sounds like, this is not a self-help show if you're listening for the first time, but every once in a while, I have a, a my literature teacher, my English teacher in high school was Dr. Paul Hurth. Uh, in the St. Louis County, Missouri. And whenever we would have to write a paper or take a test in his class, his theory was, his view on life was, if at least you write your name on the top of the paper and try and then hand it in, you will not get an F. You won't fail his class. Well, that's nice, yeah. Because there were a couple of people in class who, um, I mean, in high school we called them the stoners, who wouldn't even try. And they would fail. They didn't even want to write their name on the paper or even try and answer the questions. Um, right. And I could see how it would crush him because he was trying so hard just to get them to at least try. So I, yeah, it, to, it, to meet them at least halfway. And it really made an impression on me because I, I at least try. And that Garden Fork is all about trying. So I have a couple lessons in that this okay. week. Okay. Well, like what? Well, beekeeping. We're going to talk about beekeeping for a minute here. Um Usually I like to requeen the hives in the fall um, rather than the early spring to avoid them swarming in later spring. If you requeen in the fall, hives have a less of a propensity for swarming. If you requeen in the spring, you, you've lost like a week and a half of buildup of the brood and, and perhaps a honey flow. Right, particularly if it's a virgin queen because she's going to have to go out and mate and yeah. You know, get out all that stuff. Yeah, you know, it it can take a while. It takes a big piece out of the uh, out of the uh, season for you. And it can be incredibly difficult to find the queen. A lot of times, if they're if they're marked, sometimes the worker bees will scrape the paint off the back of the queen. If they're unmarked, it's even harder. So a beekeeping friend of mine told me about a new method where you put a queen excluder screen a week before you're going to requeen. You open up the hive and you put a queen excluder screen between every super. And oh, what, wow. what that does is it isolates the queen wherever she is. Uh, excluder screens have enough of a gap that the worker bees can kind of slide through a very narrow door. Right. And the queen is too big to get through it. So she's stuck in whatever box she's stuck in. So when queens lay eggs, they are uncovered for about five days. Right. So you open five days later, you have your new queen that you're going to requeen in a little cage, probably been shipped to you FedEx or you went and drove somewhere and picked them up. And then you open up the top of the hive and you look at one of the middle frames of the top box. If you don't see any uncapped brood with freshly laid eggs in it, the mm-hmm. queen the queen is not in that box. And so you set that one aside. You set that one aside. And then you go into the middle. I always have three mediums uh, in a hive. And then you go into the medium box and... Um, you look in there, and I just had a lot of trepidation. I became rather fixated last week about requeening because it's always been very difficult for me. Um, sometimes we just can't find the queen. And a week ago, um, the camera upright and I put the queen excluders in, and we put the hives back together. They didn't like it. <laughs> the bees did not like it. <laughs> they get, they get kind of defensive in the end of the summer anyway. And then I went out yesterday with my uh, with a good friend of mine who's a beekeeper as well. Mm-hmm. And we opened up the hive. And sure enough, we went through the supers. We found the super with uh, frames that had freshly laid eggs. And the queen, we found the queen in about 10 minutes. Oh, that's amazing. 
which is amazing. And I'm like, I'm all wound up about it. And I finally just went and did it and it worked. So yeah. it was just uh, one it, of those things where you have all this trepidation and you're like, oh, I can't do that. But, 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 and you've come up with excuses and I just went and did it and it worked very well. Yeah. You know, my worst, um, queening, requeening experience was, um, here in Virginia beach and it was so hot out that the bees were bearding a lot on the outside of the hive to, uh, to stay cooler and, uh, lessen the, um, the, uh, heat load inside the hive. And the queen, it turns out was actually under the bottom board. Yep. Yeah. I remember and, you telling us about that. Yeah. And I, I was just amazed, you know, it took me forever to find her and, uh, we we're out there just sweating our brains out in our bee suits and smoking, you know, with the smoker and everything. And, um, and, uh, and there she was just hiding underneath the, uh, the bottom board, but we found her and, uh, you know, put in the new queen and, uh, it's, it's important to do. Where'd you get your queen? Better be in Albany, New York. They sell, uh, Carnolian, Northern Carnolian Queens, and they sell them for three weeks in August. And I got in under the wire. They, uh, shipped them overnight FedEx showed up and we got them and boom, we put it in. The, the other one is, um, we just switched the Garden Fork radio uh, show to a new server on Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N.com. Probably the, uh, one of the oldest uh, uh, server outfits for podcasts in the, uh, around, isn't it? Yeah, it's going mean, to cost us. been here forever. Yeah, yeah. It's going to cost us some money every month, but it will allow for faster downloads and a much better RSS feed. A lot of, I've just run into problems with uh, the feed getting kind of basically failing. Right. And iTunes is preset to ping an RSS feed every six hours. And that was taking, that was really taxing the server that it was on. It was on our gardenfork.tv website server, and it was taking up more and more processing cycles. Right. So the website would not perform as well. And if your website doesn't draw real fast, Mm -hmm. people will bail on your website. So. You bet they will. So were, were your videos over there too? No, the videos are all running on YouTube. So. Okay. Okay. But anyway, I had to do what's called a hard code 301 redirect to tell the, all the podcast listeners from their podcast app, when it pings the RSS feed, I had to code the server to tell it to go to this new server. Mm -hmm. And no one really tells you exactly how to do that because the podcast companies don't want you to move from their server, you know? Sure, sure. So I looked it up and I found what I think was the code. And you're, you're editing what's called the .ht access file of your server, which is kind of like editing the matrix, you know? <laughs> yeah. And WordPress works within the HT access. So you have to go from within HT access, you have to find the part of the file that it that talks about WordPress because it was a WordPress generated RSS feed file. Mm -hmm. And I did it. I failed twice and I thought I was going to blow up the site, but I realized that all I needed was a dollar sign at the end of the one line of code and it worked. And it was kind of amazing where I finally well, just kind of, I breathed. I just kind of like, you know, the meditation thing. I just kind of like, okay, cleared my head. And I realized that I had forgotten to put a dollar sign in and it worked. So it's amazing. I was ready to hire someone to do it. I was like, well, let me just try this, even though I was pretty anxious about it. Yeah. If you at least try, you can't fail. There you go. That's it. So there's your two lessons. I don't know if you guys wanted a lesson in your car about Eric's, <laughs> <laughs> Eric's feel-good-isms. <laughs> well, you know, it, it happens to all of us. Uh, yesterday, I was, um, uh, I'd put some new steps on the, um, uh, on the deck, and it's three steps down. And I had two risers and it was just obvious after this is several months ago, um, they were bowing in the middle that I just needed a third riser in there in the middle. And I went and uh, took them off and went and bought a third riser, put it in the middle. And it just wasn't cut like the, um, the old risers, you know, I, I don't know how they were done. And I looked at it and fooled with it and fooled with it. And I finally just got out the sawzall and, um, you know, trimmed it around and whatnot. And it worked fine. 
you know, and it, and it, it looked good enough. Um, you know, there's one little spot where you can kind of see where I've, I've been trimming on it and whatnot, but I thought, well, you know, that was so easy. And, and I, I had been, um, worrying myself about yeah. <laughs> doing it and what could go wrong and why, why it wouldn't work. And, and you know, and I, I just went and got it. I said, it's wood. I can trim it. I can make it fit. I can, you know, whatever. And it, it, it worked out beautifully. And now I have three risers and uh, support in the middle. So it doesn't bow. And no one um, else is going to see that mistake. You know, it's there, but no one else does. Yeah. But, and that's interesting. Uh, when we were painting on the uh, front door here a while back, um, it's uh, kind of a beige with a black trim and the black trim a little in places got away from me and I just couldn't stand it, but I left it because it was so hot and we were so tired and I just said, well, I'll fix it later. And now, uh, some months later, I don't even notice it. So, you uh, you know, little, little, little problems, uh, just kind of go away with time. Sweet. Cool. So we have a couple new videos out for Garden Fork. We had one about saving uh, seed, uh, specifically string bean seed. Come, some neat kind of feedback from that one. And also, I made a video when I had to replace a skylight on the roof in Brooklyn, and you you had some questions about that. Yeah, I I guess I don't quite understand the uh, the skylight that you took off has a like a well, plexiglass dome on it. Had a plexiglass dome on it, but you didn't put a pe- plexiglass dome back on the new skylight. No. Why not? Um they well, I plexiglass is a, is a commercial is a brand name. I think it's called is it called Lexan polycarbonate? I can't remember the uh, some sort of polycarbonate. Yeah, right. exactly, but you you know what I mean. They're not UV stable. Right, yeah. So well, that's they, the reason that one was broken to begin with. They fog and then they crack. Um, because this one had a huge hunk out of it. I'm like, did a piece of a satellite or a meteorite fall on my roof? You know. Mm-hmm. But it's just the hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, and the UV light. Um, it cracked it and a big chunk fell off. You sure it wasn't hail or something? We used to have that down in Texas. Um, you know, hail busting through skylights. I didn't remember any recent hail when, when that happened, but yeah. Um, I, I went with a, 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 I wouldn't say a high quality, I'd call it a medium quality skylight that's designed for flat roofs and it's, um, it's double glazed glass, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not safety glass. It doesn't have the wires in it, but right. it, it is designed for a flat roof. So they've, they've brought, kept in mind the idea that objects will hit the glass. So I don't know exactly what they do to make it crack or dent resistant um it must be tempered in some way it is tempered uh-huh. um and it is a lot stronger than window glass um because it is a flat skylight but it's definitely built for flat for flat roofs ah and well, it went it, on so easily y- oh yeah that that was the easiest project i've ever seen you do <laughs> take off old one put on new one <laughs> Oh. And I was like dreading it because first you've got to get the skylight up onto the roof and it's a ladder to the roof, you know, mm-hmm. so you're like humping it up on a rope and I built a whole new what's called a curb because it's a flat roof. You can't put the skylight right on the roof. You have to build up a little essentially like a little dam around it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the existing curb was a perfect fit. So I was like, oh, this is so nice. And all you do yeah. is you, the new ones are great because they have a really nice hefty rubber gasket and you literally drop the thing on, you press it down a little bit and you screw it into the side and you're done. Well, now how would you, um, if you had to put the new curb down, how would you waterproof that around the edges? Well, the quick and dirty way would be with a ton of roof tar. Mm. Oh, Um, okay. But is it, it's a rubber roof. It's an EPDM roof. Mm -hmm. And prior to a couple of years ago, you could use, um, a giant, um, a blowtorch to you would get some additional pieces of rubber and then you would melt them up onto the curb. So that's how they used to get EPDM to con- contact with itself was you would just heat the heck, you would melt it essentially. Oh, you own a blowtorch. Yes, I do. I've seen you do steaks with it. Yeah. But on a, <laughs> on a wooden roof, I have a wooden, wooden sheathed roof. You can't use um, a torch anymore. It's called a torch down roof. So now they have EPDM that you can weld together with a cold glue, and it works mm-hmm. quite well. Um, they don't seem to be a lot of problems with it. You have to know what you're doing. So you would take long rectangular sheets of this. 
and you would glue it to the existing roof and then uh, basically run it up against the curb and glue it to that as well. And the corners are a little tricky. Um, if I had to do that, I might have hired someone to just throw down some EPDM around the curb, but thankfully I didn't have to. Right. And so really, uh, this EPDM, this is the same stuff they're using for, um, like green roofs. Yep. You, you put, you put it down the, as your base, uh, before you start building the, um, the green part of the roof. Yeah. Before you put your plants on and stuff, it's, mm -hmm. it's a giant long sheet of rubber and it's really nice. Wow. <laughs> Because, I mean, in asphalt, you know, they make asphalt roll roofing, and boy, that stuff. Putting it down is hard. Getting it off is even harder. And uh, the rubber roofs last 20, 30 years, maybe. Oh, that's plenty long. And if you have a leak in them, they're really easy to fix. You can just lay down some tar with some mesh. Of course, we have a garden fork video about doing roof repair. So. I remember that one. Yeah. So is that, does that answer your skylight? I think so, yeah. I, I just, you know, to me, it just seemed odd that, you know, you didn't put a a, a, a kind of a protected cover back on top of it. But uh, you can see out, uh, you can see the sky now. It's nice. If you're thinking yeah. about skylights, uh, I like to quote a good friend of mine who's a contractor in New York, uh, Mikey K. He says, Eric, you know what a skylight is? I'm like, no, what? He goes, it's a hole in your roof. Yes, it is. <laughs> and so that was his opinion on skylines. <laughs> uh, yeah, we um, have a lot of homes around here where I live that, uh, of course, they're they're sloped roofs, but they put skylights in them, and uh, that's probably one of the uh, the biggest sources of leaks for most people around here. I think a skylight on a flat roof is much less problematic than a skylight on a gable roof. Why is that? Because it's it's much easier to build a curb up around it, and the mm -hmm. force the force of water coming off a gable roof or a, a an angled roof rather than a flat roof is is much more intense. I think. Oh. So just my thoughts. Okay. Well. Also, a lot uh, easier to repair than a gable yeah. roof. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I appreciate your thoughts on that. I I just I've never owned a flat roof, and I had never seen that before, and. Um, it was just so amazingly easy. I didn't think it could be the garden fork way. <laughs> Nothing went wrong. How unusual. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Real quick, if you do us a favor, go to your computer, log on to iTunes, and write a review, a five-star review, hopefully, of Garden Fork Radio. And if you like, Garden Fork, the TV video show as well. We have two podcasts on iTunes. If you would use words like DIY, food, podcast, cooking, gardening, that'd be cool too, right? So go to iTunes, say nice things about us. That'll really help us in the search on iTunes so more people can find Garden Fork and listen to cool stuff. Thanks. Hey, we have uh, uh, some viewer comment from Scott, who's one of our Patreon donors. Right. If you'd like to learn about our Patreon campaign, it's patreon.com slash garden fork, or there's a link in the show notes of the show about it. If you would like to buy garden fork, a cup of coffee a month, that's about what it would cost. And we would appreciate it. Yeah. Help us buy new gear. We got some new gear. It's very nice. But yeah. Scott um, is going to be a guest on the show, but we talked about grilling steak right on chunk charcoal. And he had a comment here. Scott says, I've been doing that same method. Oh, sorry, Scott. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was well, reading this and it didn't seem like that's what he was talking about at all, Eric. <laughs> I was talking about in a previous podcast about cooling the house and how yeah. during the day I open windows on the cool side of the house. Well, basically during the hot of the heat of the day, I shut all the windows and just run fans inside. Mm -hmm. And then in the evening I open the windows and I put box fans in the windows and blow cold air into the house all night. Right. And Scott had a comment about this. He said, I've been doing that same method for cooling the house down. It works very well. One thing, one, one added thing I do is crack open the attic access to allow hot air at the top of the house to escape. I made a screen to go over it. So to keep insects from getting in the house, there's also an attic fan that runs when the temperature is above 20 degrees centigrade, that's 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and that really helps pull hot air out during the day. I'll cool. bet so. So he has a, I have a attic fan as well. It's a temperature controlled to cool the attic, which helps cool the whole house. 
But if you open up the uh, access panel to go from the usually your hallway up into the attic and put a screen in there, that fan will also pull air from the house, hot air from the house, out through the attic. It's kind of neat. It's also sometimes bigger versions of that. It's called a whole house fan. Whole house fan. Yeah, we we had one in San Antonio and it was wonderful. Uh, we here and it's particularly good for uh, ranch style houses that don't have a second floor. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you can get uh, that that solar chimney movement going, uh, you know your place. Well, both of your places, uh, you can open the bottom uh, windows, open the uh, windows on the second floor, and get that natural air movement going with what they call a solar chimney going. But uh, with a uh, ranch style house, it's much harder to um, to do that, and so a whole house fan really helps there. Yeah, I like that idea. That might be in the future of garden fork care. Yeah, they're they're easy to do. Um, uh, we just haven't done one here, but it uh, you know this the uh, we're coming up on my favorite time of the year here. Uh, the, I call them the long shoulder months of the year, uh, and here in uh, Margaritaville North, it is just so wonderful to um, to enjoy the house, open it up, uh, let the cooler breezes flow through. Um, it's it, you know and it'll last uh, well into November for us. So uh, we're, I'm looking forward to it because August has been unbelievably hot. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's all right. You know, uh, what you're doing, too, is um, reminds me, I have a friend that owns an adobe house, and that's exactly how they, uh, they cool down their house uh, because the, uh, the adobe will absorb all that cool at night and then re-radiate it uh, during the day and keep the house fairly cool. So that and the ceiling fans to uh, cool you off because ceiling fans cool people. They don't cool uh, the house itself. Exactly. Um, yeah, like they blow air over you. Um, they can keep you quite comfortable and uh, keep your utility bills very low. Sweet. Hey, um, I just heard an interesting podcast that I sent to Rick, but our friends, our West Coast friends at Root Simple, they just interviewed a gentleman who runs a urban homesteading store and they talked about aquaponics and I know that really Rick was into that. So I sent him the link for that. And it's, it's very basic information, but I thought it was very informative. I know a lot about it just from talking to Rick, but if you're interested in aquaponics, uh, rootsimple.com or just go to root simple on iTunes and uh, listen to that. Okay. Well, it's in my list. I have been meaning to go to root simple and, uh, and subscribe to it, but I just haven't gotten around to it. You know, I uh, am embarrassed almost to tell you that there are 171 podcasts in my podcast feed right now. Wow. What is there a standout one you found interesting you want to share? Uh, you know, I have been really interested in the podcast business, the business of making podcasts right now. And uh, there are two. One is from the, um, uh, the Neiman School of, um, of uh, Journalism. And I forget what it's called, but if you look up Neiman, N-E-I-M-A-N, uh, you'll you'll find it, and the other is uh, one called the Pub, and um, and it's really a bunch of refugees from uh, NPR who were uh, talking about how to uh, really improve the uh, the quality and standards of podcasting, and to uh, make it a little more fair for everybody who's involved in it. And I'm I'm really in, uh, it's been um, fascinating to listen to. They want to up the standards. That means we might not be able to podcast, Rick. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. They're, they, you know, one of the things they talked about is uh, uh, people are getting too tied up in, in upping the, the production quality over just finding great interviews to do. And that people that listen to podcasts are more tolerant of errors and, and a little background noise and whatnot, as long as the, um, uh, the, the subjects you're interviewing are really interesting and you're, you're, you're doing some good stuff. And so, um, they, it's, it's just not, it's not the NPR crowd is yeah. essentially what he was saying. The, you know, where you have to have the absolute first rate, um, uh, audio. podcasting uh, audio kind of things. And one of the things he said, you know, he, he used to, when he was working at NPR, he'd go around from studio to studio to studio, dragging this poor guy around, uh, who was trying to interview, looking for a free microphone when this perfect studio with all the, the foam, uh, absorbing, uh, sound absorbing stuff on the walls and whatnot. And now when he, um, uh, he's away from that 
and he's also an academic and he has those, you know, those black graduation gowns that the you know, academics wear. Yep. And he just throws that, he tents himself with that in his microphone. And that's, and, his, uh, that's his sound it, booth. <laughs> it, it's a sound booth. He does that um, uh, when he's uh, doing telephone interviews. And oh, I sweet. thought, well, it, isn't that amazing? You know, so he, that way he doesn't have to go look for a, um, a, a studio. He just has a, a pretty good quality microphone there at his desk. Well, you'll like the Root Simple episode of Aquaponics because they're out in the, the yard of the home, urban homesteading store with traffic going by, cars honking, motorcycles, and kids. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but the content is very good. So there you go. Okay. Well, the dog's okay. Yeah, they're good. They're out in the yard barking at yeah, something. Yeah, so we, we missed them. Didn't get to see them on the roof. Probably yeah. not a good place to throw balls, right? No, it's a flat roof, and yeah. uh, there's a ladder. Those ba- so. Balls go over the edge. You know, you don't want to lose a dog that way. No. All right, so we should go. So thank you, everyone. Uh, if you're listening on iTunes, if you'd write a review for us, that really helps Garden Fork in the uh, search and rankings of Garden of iTunes. So people, more, more people find us and want to listen to me pontificate. So... All right. Okay. Well, I'm going to move on down the road. I got a lot to do today, my friend. So make it a great day, everyone. We'll see you later. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Garden Fork's theme music is used under license from uniquetracks.com.